Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. Uh, this is my first lecture as part of my Turing test module in my Philosophy of Mind course. This is the first lecture on Searle's Chinese Room Thought Experiment, um, and it wraps up a discussion we've been having about building thinking machines. So, uh, John Searle as early as 1980 came up with this very powerful uh, very intuitive argument that seems to refute um, what people have come to call the Turing thesis. Uh, so what's that argument? Um, there were some artificial intelligence researchers at the time, Terry Winograd, Shank, um, some others who were arguing that some good old-fashioned GoFi good old-fashioned artificial intelligence systems um, explained or accounted for or um, fully expanded on the notion of what it is to understand. Uh, some of these people like Shank said um, that a sufficiently adequately programmed uh, computer understands a story uh, in a case. And what had happened was that Shank had devised a program that you could um, feed it a script or feed it a story that explained in English um, some events that happened. I think one of the examples was about a guy who goes into a restaurant, he orders a burger, when the, when the burger comes it's um, um, undercooked, he storms out of the restaurant, says I'm not paying for this, and leaves, or leaves without paying or something like that. And one of the questions was, did the man eat the hamburger? Any, any normal sort of English speaker, native English speaker who heard that story would infer sort of understanding from the context that it's obvious, quickly obvious and clear that um, the guy didn't eat the hamburger. He was mad. He didn't like it. He was upset that it wasn't, wasn't cooked. Um, so AI researchers and especially natural language processors uh, like Shank were struggling with these natural language uh, processing challenges like this and trying to build computer programs that could handle those sorts of problems and answer them adequately. So Shank had made the bold claim um, that strong AI, a uh, sufficiently programmed pro computer program like that, could explain what it is to understand. And I'll explain those details in some more detail. Or I'll explain the theses in some more detail. So Searle comes back and says, this argument that I'm about to give you uh, proves that strong AI is false. Okay, so what's strong AI? The claim that he got from Shank and some other AI researchers was that the appropriately programmed computer really is a mind in the sense that computers given the right programs can be literally said to understand and have other cognitive states. Uh, strong AI thesis two is that, a, that the machine can literally be said to understand the story and provide answers to questions. Uh, that when it succeeds at that task, it's understanding, and that what the machine and the program do explains the human ability to understand the story and answer questions about it. So they thought, and this is back in the 70s, they thought that they had figured this out. Now notice, this is GoFi. This is good old-fashioned serial processing, hand-coded, everything anticipated, everything built into the system, uh, deterministic, GoFi of the sort we've been talking about for a couple of weeks, right? So, so Searle is responding to AI researchers in the 70s, and we have since seen some of the AI development, AI research developments all the way into the 2020s, and we've seen what's happened with artificial neural networks is a very different story. So try to get yourself sort of in this mindset of the kind of program that um, Searle was thinking about. You know, he was imagining like a like a handheld calculator. Uh, no more understands than than um, than than this system does. And here's why he thinks so. Okay, so here's what he says. Imagine that I, Cyril, am in a room with a set of instructions in English for how to respond to Chinese symbols. And Cyril picks Chinese because he doesn't know Chinese. He has no idea what Chinese means. He can't do the translations. So the instructions reveal nothing about the meaning of the symbols to him. They only tell him which Chinese symbols to return in response to the ones he has given. Searle is following a set of formal instructions, a program for passing the Turing test. The instructions are formal or syntactic only because they allow him to recognize the characters by their shape only, not by their meaning. Okay, so what's going on here is uh, the room. Uh, well, I'll get to the room in just a second. I'll show you a diagram of the room. Here's the idea is that 
Cyril's inside this room, and he gets, he receives on a, a letter slot on one side of the room, he receives a batch of Chinese characters. And he, doesn't, he has no idea what these mean. And so if you could, you've got to keep the analogy straight here. Searle is to this room what the computer is to the AI uh, researcher in the other example. So the AI researchers claim that they've built a computer that when you, so when you program it the right way, when you feed in a story into one side, and then you feed in a question about the story into that side, it will give out the right answer on the other side. So now Searle is playing the part of that computer on the inside. You've got to get clear on the analogy. And the program that the, that the, that's instantiated in the um, AI system is this batch of, or is this set of instructions that Searle has in the room. Um, so the instructions are already in there, and Searle is just playing the, the programming, you know, the, the, the machine. And then the Chinese story comes in, and then the Chinese questions come in. Then Searle receives another batch of Chinese characters. This is a question about the story that just came in the slot. Searle correlates the question with the story using a set of instructions he has in English. Then he delivers an answer in Chinese to the question out the other side of the room. So the room is like, there's Searle in there with a bunch of simple sort of input-output uh, instructions. And when something comes in one side, he figures out by correlating the shape, not the meaning, but just the syntactic um, role that it plays in these rules, what he's supposed to give out on the other side, and he produces an output. So Searle, the combination of Searle in there in the room, and that book, which represents all the instructions that the AI system is enacting, um, uh, uh, Searle standing in for the computer. All right, so you, just so you understand, you got to make sure you understand how the, uh, the situation is set up. Okay, so he is, in our thought experiment, um, playing the part as if he were the computer. Okay, so his English instructions then might look something like this. If you see this shape, followed by these shapes, followed by these shapes, then produce this shape, and then followed by this shape. So none of that um, relates the content or the information to Searle. He doesn't know what any of those symbols mean. All he understands is the English, and he's just correlating in terms of shape. Okay, that's important because that's what he means by syntactic manipulation. He's just um, formally recognizing that the rule says that if there's these squiggles, then you give out these squiggles. Um, and it's just about the rule, rule following, with no connection to the content and no awareness on his part about the story. He has no idea that he's, he doesn't understand the Chinese. He just understands the English, which tells him how to manipulate the Chinese. Okay, so by hypothesis then, if the story goes right, and if we believe it, to the native English speakers, or sorry, to the native Chinese speakers outside of the room, <clears throat> the room gives every appearance of understanding and answering the questions given to it. So you put in a question on the input side, uh, you put in the story, you put in the questions, and then it gives out an, a, an answer on the other side, and it does it right. It answers the questions correctly, and it does everything that the uh, strong AI system had done before. It's just now that Searle is instantiating the same system. Okay, so you all, you all set, you all understand um, the whole setup. So now comes a very important stage in the argument. Question, do you think Searle, or the room, the combination of all this stuff, understands the story in Chinese. Is there understanding in this scenario? In this scenario, does that room or that book or Searle or anything here, is there understanding in that scenario? Okay, so what we're supposed to say and what most people do because of the way this is set up, most people answer an emphatic no. You have a very strong intuition that that thing doesn't understand. Searle doesn't understand. He still doesn't know Chinese. Um, and it's implausible to say that something else understands. If there was understanding going on here, surely Searle would know it. If the program were sufficient for understanding or thinking, then Searle would understand the meaning of the story in Chinese. So that's a very important explicit premise in Searle's argument. If that program were sufficient, for understanding, then Searle would understand, or something about this situation would demonstrate understanding to us, but it doesn't. Searle does not understand the story in Chinese, so therefore the strong AI thesis number two is false. Um, 
that this is not real understanding. And furthermore, a program of formal instructions for passing the Turing test is not sufficient for understanding or thinking. So strong AI thesis number three is false. He thinks he's disproved all of these charges um, coming from the AI researchers who claim that, you know, that this thing understands, it sufficiently explains human understanding, and it's what we're doing when we answer questions in Chinese or answer questions in any, in any language. Okay, so in other words, a, a Turing machine. And by a Turing machine now we mean a machine that can pass the Turing test. Um, and we've talked about this at great length now in our course. It takes more than being able to pass the test to be able to understand or think. So by hypothesis, Searle allows that this room would pass the test. So by looking at it from the outside, you look at it and go, look, that thing answers every question we ask it. It does fine with the questions, produces the right sorts of answers. Um, but it... Um, uh, uh, yeah, but it, it, it can't possibly be thinking, it doesn't understand. So it passes the test, but doesn't understand. Sorry. Okay, so there's a number of assumptions here that need to be brought out to make it explicit in the reaction that comes afterwards. So very powerful argument, very strongly intuitive. Most people can get their heads around it, and most people have a very strong intuition in favor of Searle's conclusion. No, this thing can't understand, and therefore something's wrong with the Turing test. The Turing test is not sufficient to demonstrate understanding. Okay, so uh, one of the assumptions is that a serial state program could be written that could su successfully pass the Turing test. Um, the actual program that Shank had described and the one that they were debating about doesn't pass the Turing test. This is just a, a sort of hypothesis. Being able to answer a few questions about some script that you get fed is not nearly sufficient to actually pass the Turing test. Passing the Turing test, as we've seen, is a much more um, robust, much more difficult task. Um, or perform some comparable function. So Shank is assuming that they can write a program that'll pass the Turing test. This is back in the 70s. And Searle is using that assumption then to turn it around. Okay, now we know, and this has since been long since been demonstrated to be false, you cannot write a successful uh, Turing program this way. Um, a serial state uh, program will not pass the Turing test, or at least we've had 50 more years of attempts to try to sort this out, and no one's been able to write that sort of program that would actually pass the test. Okay, but Shank thought that they could do it. Um, Turing thought that they could do it. This was only a few decades after Turing had said it, and Searle is just taking Shank up on that presumption. Okay, so they turn out to both be wrong about that, so that actually undermines an important pillar of this argument um, if we're going to get into the weeds about whether or not this succeeds or what it, what it succeeds at showing. Okay, Searle's also assuming, for the sake of argument, that the program could then be rendered into a series of executable English instructions for symbol manipulation that would make it possible for him to quote-unquote read the code. Okay, so in the slide I just put up, you saw... Uh, I had these, you know, painfully oversimplified examples of English sentences that say, if you see these squiggles, and then these squiggles, and then these squiggles, then you respond with these squiggles. Okay, that sounds simple, sounds obvious, it seems like it could be done. Um, Searle's accepting for the sake of argument that you could take a, um, first off, that you could write a program that could pull off this project and that that could then be rendered back into English in a way that somebody like Searle in the room could um, execute it or play the role of the of the computer. Uh, that's, I suppose, not implausible given that uh, if, if we're going to accept the first assumption, then the second one makes some sense. If we accept the first assumption on this page, um, we're already accepting for the sake of argument that programmers could write some code that could um, when executed on a serial state machine could pass the test. So if programmers could write it, then a programmer could sit down and look at it and read it, right? So if you can do some basic trans translation of it over into English. So when actually when um, programmers write code, when they write it in you know C++ or in Python, they're using a bunch of formal symbols and it has a very specific grammar that you have to compose your lines of code in and none of it's in English. But what will often happen is that a, a typical programming language will have a convention where you can put uh, parentheses or quotes in a, in a comment after the line of code and many programmers in order to make it clear to the 
to anyone who comes and looks at the code after they write it, um, they will put an English comment into the code. And you set it off with uh, uh, quotes or parentheses, and those symbols tell the computer to ignore what's inside that little parenthetical remark. But the parenthetical remark will tell the um, you know another programmer who's reading the code what that line of code is supposed to do. Okay, so if we're accepting the first assumption, then we've got to accept the second assumption, namely that a human could read the code. Um, and uh, I suppose one of the other important assumptions here is that the code has been rendered into this weird um, syntactic uh, symbol manipulation uh, process, right? So um, the code is not just the code that Searle's going through. The code is a bunch of English translations of code that, that tell you what to do with pictures. The pictures are squiggles that, that are meaningless to Searle. Okay, so there's a lot going on there that maybe once we get into the weeds, we would reject. This turns out won't be the most important things that we might uh, protest about in Searle's argument. Okay, so uh, back to the conclusion. Why does it feel like the Chinese room doesn't understand? Because everybody, when they hear this thing for the first time, this may have been the first time you've heard it, everybody, when they hear this story, when it's set up like that, and you ask the question, does that room understand? Almost everybody goes, no, that's not understanding. That's, there's something missing there. Okay, so why? We have a strong intuition that it wouldn't understand. It just seems obvious, and Searle says some things like this, with the problem stated this way, that there isn't any real understanding going on. Um, and, and this has always bugged me. I think that Searle assumes this. If there is understanding going on in this circumstance, then it seems like Searle would know it, or it would be manifest to him, or manifest to us watching it. You know, we're all watching this thing unfold. Somebody here ought to be able to recognize whether or not Searle's going on, or whether or not understanding is going on. Um, that seems to me the not insignificant suppressed premise. Uh, that bears scrutiny. Like, um, were you to look at the, I mean, just, just, to, just to sort of um, chisel away at this assumption about understanding, were you to look at the electrical chemical patterns that are coursing over a normally functioning brain um, in real time when a, a normal human brain, uh, actually, I just thought of this. Okay, suppose you put somebody into a highly advanced fMRI machine that can give us very detailed imaging in real time about what's going on at the macro level across these neural networks in their brains. And then you hand that guy in the fMRI machine a script of a story in English, and then you hand, and this is a native English speaker, and you hand this native English speaker a question about the uh, story, and then the guy in the fMRI machine says, no, the man didn't pay for the burger when he um, when it came out raw or whatever. Uh, so question, uh, were you looking just at the electrical chemical activity that's cascading across all these neural networks? Would understanding, quote unquote, be manifest to you? Would it seem that something that's just merely having electrical chemical signals passing across its networks, would that be understanding? Um, and I think in this case, you know, you look at that and go, look, the understanding, whatever that is, is not manifest to you there either. Uh, so this is probably a really important suppressed premise in Searle's argument that doesn't bear up much under much scrutiny. This There's a lot of artificial uh, constructions here that produce... Uh, an intuition that lead us to side with Searle in this argument uh, that I think are, are like they're artificial and they don't bear up under much scrutiny. So I'm not sympathetic ultimately to Searle's argument, but I find myself trying to figure out, spend a lot of time trying to figure out just where does the thing mislead us. Um, okay, Searle would be able to detect whether he understands in a situation like that. Um, and it seems like in the thought experiment, he wouldn't detect any understanding, or we don't detect any, whatever that is. And since he doesn't understand Chinese, or it doesn't seem like to us that the Chinese room doesn't understand, therefore it doesn't understand. That's a really um, important premise that deserves some analysis. And you're all going to be writing a paper on this.
uh, example, and I'm, I'm throwing that out there to the wolves. Here's some ideas about places where you could put pressure on Searle's argument to possibly give some objections. Um, therefore, Searle concludes there must not be any understanding going on. Okay, so uh, what happens in the literature in the next 20, 30 years is an explosion of reactions. Um, a whole bunch of people in cognitive science, computer science, uh, artificial intelligence, philosophy of mind react against Searle's argument. One of the families of arguments against Searle that comes out of all of this literature, all of these articles that get written, is called the systems reply. And the system's reply, more or less, is uh, reduced down to this line. The man by himself in the room doesn't understand Chinese, but some larger system that includes the, you know, Searle in the room, the program, the scratch paper that he might be using to keep track of what he's doing as he's, you know, shuffling papers in and out, the inputs, and so on, the whole system understands Chinese. So it's not Searle that understands, but the whole thing understands. And some people built out this argument and sort of pressed for, um, you know, a, an answer to give some different intuitions here. There's a way to tell that whole story that once you include all that, it might seem plausible that the whole thing understands. So famously, then, um, well, I'll give you I'll give you Searle's resp response in a second. So Ned Block, really famous uh, philosopher of mind, was one of the first one to press this, along with Copeland, Dennett, Fodor, Hoagland, Kurzweil, George Ray. Um, you know, the who's who of late 20th century philosophy of mind and artificial intelligence research, they all push this back against Searle's argument. Okay, here's what Searle says. Okay, here's what I'll do in response to this. It's the systems reply. Internalize the whole system. I'm going to memorize everything. I'm going to take this book I was using, that I was using to manipulate the symbols, and instead of looking at the book, I'm just going to put it in my head. I'm just going to memorize it, so I just do it from memory the ledgers, all the procedure matters, you know, the whole program, everything that I was enacting, that I was, all the resources I was using in the room that were helping me do the input-output processing, I'm just going to internalize all that and put it into my head. Okay, so if we accepted the first, you know, uh, Chinese room uh, scenario, this one doesn't seem that much more contrary to reason. Now notice, it doesn't matter if we say to Searle, oh, that's impossible, you couldn't do something like that. I mean, that's one of the convenient things about a thought experiment for philosophers. The practical matters of whether or not something could, like this could be, in, in principle, um, in, in practice, be made real, doesn't matter. Um, the, the, the idea is that if hypothetically somebody could memorize all this stuff, or if there's no obstacle in principle to just internalizing all this, then we can just add it into the story, and now we can ask the next question. Um, now Searle is the whole system. Um, and it seems still obvious that he's no longer, that he still doesn't understand. Searle says, I internalize everything, so now you hand me a script in Chinese, or even, you know, even even worse, you can talk to me in Chinese. And I've now internalized a set of rules for how to process that in terms of just syntactic symbol manipulation. And I'm successfully giving back answers in Chinese. Or I'm writing them out and handing them to you. So now it's all been internalized. I'm doing the very thing I was doing, doing before. I've just gotten rid of the room. But I don't understand any more now than I did in the first case. So Searle says... Therefore, the system's reply doesn't solve the problem. Adding in the whole system or internalizing the system or, or expanding the uh, example to include the whole system just doesn't change the, the problem that this thing doesn't understand because now Searle's the whole system and he doesn't understand, at least in, your, in the thought experiment, right? Um, at least that's what Searle thinks he's, gonna, he's demonstrated with his answer to the system's reply. Okay, I won't go down further into the weeds onto that one. Um, although I will say this much, um, Searle says, and I'm sorry, Dan Dennett comes back and pushes back uh, a bit more on the system's reply, and he accuses Searle of making a, a kind of a, a making a fallacy here. So this is all from Dan Dennett. We see clearly enough that if there were understanding in such a giant system. It would not be Searle's understanding, since he is just a cog in the machine, oblivious to the context of what he's doing. Okay, so he's just a part in this bigger system. We also see clearly that there is nothing remotely like genuine understanding in any hunk of programming, small enough to imagine readily. Whatever it is, it's just a mindless routine for transforming symbol strings into other symbol strings according to some mechanical or syntactical recipe. And that's really crucial here, because that 
you know, we pictured that little chunk of programming, and it's it seems to us that when we imagine that little instruction, that that thing doesn't understand. So, um, so next, what happens, or what Dennett says is, then comes the suppressed premise. Surely more of the same, no matter how much more, would never add up to genuine understanding. You know, so my diagram that showed a couple of instructions of how to manipulate an answer to Chinese symbols um, was all that I gave you, and it's all that Searle offered us as by by way of getting us to sort of um, you know picture the details of this example, and so we sort of readily zoom out to the bigger picture. Oh yeah, well I can kind of imagine a couple of rules, a couple of if-then English rules that tell me how to answer to Chinese symbols that I don't understand. So I can just expand that and I just um, dial that all the way up and I just imagine, okay, so imagine now that I've got millions of those and that's all I've got. And that's all that this program really is, is just millions of those. So if a few of those can't understand in their own little way, then millions more don't understand anymore. Um, so it looks like Dennett might be accusing Searle of committing the fallacy of composition, um, that if, if a part of the system can't doesn't have a property X, then the whole system doesn't have property X. And you might recall that way back in the beginning of the semester, um, I warned against making this kind of mistake when I was talking about Leibniz. That, look, there's a very easy, slippery uh, mistake here that when we start thinking about um, brain processing, for instance, just in terms of um, a few sodium ions traversing, you know, a... Um, a uh, neurotransmitter uh, or the neurotransmitters moving across this synaptic gap in the brain, when you picture that, it's very easy to sort of think, well, lots more of that can't be understanding or can't be a poem or can't be a feeling. So there must be some, you know, Leibniz makes this move. Um, Leibniz seems to commit this fallacy of composition here. Um, or maybe Dennett's accusing him of, look, the intuitions that you've generated here rely on some false oversimplifications of what the real story would be like. Okay, so that's Dennett pushing back and sort of giving the systems reply some more teeth against Searle's um, systems reply answer. Okay, so when you write about this and when you think about this and when you work on this for the test, keep everything straight. Okay, so there's the strong AI position first that says a sufficiently programmed computer is a mind it understands. Then, then there's the Chinese room thought experiment that Searle gives in response to strong AI that, that alleges to prove that the Turing thesis or the strong AI thesis is false, that, is, that this machine can't think or doesn't understand. And then there's the systems reply that re it's a rebuttal to Searle. So it tr strives to restore something like strong AI. The systems reply tries to give, um, to resurrect the argument against Searle and defeat the Chinese realm. And then Searle gives a reply to the systems reply. So it's a systems reply reply where Searle says, I internalized the whole system, I don't understand, therefore the system reply is false. So Searle seeks to restore the original Chinese room argument against strong AI. Okay, so keep all the camps straight. Is it going to get even more confusing when we consider the robot reply? So another camp of reactions um, argued for something like this. What the system needs uh, and what it's missing in your example, Searle, is that it needs some external access to the world that the stories and questions are about. If the system had that kind of access, then it could make the necessary connections. Okay, now a couple of important things about the robot reply. The robot reply seems to be rejecting some of what Shank um, uh, accepted in the original strong AI position. So Shank had said, and Searle took him at his word, that, that a sufficiently programmed computer of that sort um, understands and manifests or demonstrates the human ability to uh, have a mind and understand. The robot reply people seem to be saying, no, there's actually something wrong even with Shank's presumption here. They seem to be saying this, the, the right kind of artificial system that actually can understand um, is different than even what Shank described 
the right kind of system actually needs to be a robot that has some causal interaction with the world that goes out and contacts the objects that it has um, encounters with or that it describes um, that one of the problems in the Chinese room example was that um, there was no connection to hamburgers and no connection to restaurants and no connection to the guy eating the hamburger. Like there was no um, semantics that gave the symbols meaning. And to, to get that, to, to make the system um, really understand, it needs to be causally connected to the real world in a way that Shank's system was not. So the robot reply is actually rejecting Shank's position for some different, more fundamental reasons. And, it, and then arguing that Searle's off the mark because of this presumption that they both share. Uh, okay, so they say if you build a robot that can interact with the world, that's causally connected to the objects that the stories, the questions, and the answers are about, then that thing is more plausibly said to understand. Okay, well, you maybe anticipate here what Searle's going to say. Um, Searle says, okay, robot reply people, how about this? Put me inside the robot and have me execute the computational instructions of a robot program. Because the, if you've got a robot, then it's got to have some program. Okay, just make me the command center. Just put me inside and let me do all of the uh, instructions, execute all of the instructions of the code. Suppose that some of his, that is Searle, inside the Chinese room, so now Searle in his Chinese room is actually inside the robot's head, if you like, um, you know, like that uh, Pacific Rim movie or something. He's inside running the, the levers and the gears of the robot. And what he's getting now, and by hypothesis, is that he's getting his information from a TV that's mounted inside or mounted outside the robot. Suppose the robot's navigating around the world, but what Searle's getting on the inside is a bunch of strings of ones and zeros translated into, you know, quote-unquote sensory data, and then he's got a bunch of um, English instructions for how to deal with those ones and zeros. So the robot then, um, some of his responses, it turns out, unknown to him, that is Searle inside the robot, command center, are instructions for manipulating the robot's arms, legs, head, etc. Okay, so this this is going to make your, all going to make your head spin, right? This is all a very complicated sort of scenario. Here's what we're, Here's what's happening. Um, Searle and the strong AI people are arguing about whether or not um, a bunch of lines of code in a good old-fashioned AI serial programming uh, program understands. And Searle takes them at their word and grants that suppose you could write some code that would successfully pass the Turing test when somebody comes up and interviews it and the computer and asks it a bunch of questions, it gets answers that satisfies the interrogator. And the robot reply says, well, really to build a successful Turing machine, you got to write the code and you need to build this thing that actually has these, it can't just be a internally sealed off system from the world, it needs to actually get up and move around and interact with the objects in the world. That if it's if it's cameras or it's microphones or it's actuators and servos and um, detectors, since detectors on its periphery are interacting with objects in the world, that thing could more plausibly be said to be understanding than this sort of sealed off antiseptic um, lines of code in the original example. So Searle says, okay, if you think that's more plausibly um, describing an understanding system, then just incorporate me into the system and have me do the executing of the program now. I'm going to be, uh, by hypothesis in our thought experiment, I'll be running the robot from the inside, but again, I'm just going to be manipulating um, symbols or ones and zeros according now instead of squiggles um, according to a bunch of rules. I've got a bunch of English rules that tell me when I get this string of ones and zeros from my camera inside my command center, then I do this. I, I run this lever or I work this lever or I give this output of these ones and zeros. Um, okay, so now Searle again has inserted himself into the system and he's become the, the brain of the system. And then he's expecting you to have this reaction again, he's now calling all of the shots according to a program. He's running the robot, but does Searle now understand? 
And Searle's counting on all of us to look at that example and go, surely that he doesn't understand any more now than he did before. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't grasp the meaning of his terms. He's no more apprised of real reactions or real interactions with the real world. And the system no more understands than it did in the first case. Um, so back and forth, back and forth, right? Uh, it might help to sort of flow chart out, you know, who says what and at what stage we are in the argument in the various stages. And you're going to have to read through this thing 10 times to keep everybody all straight. Okay, one more reaction um, that I'm going to offer from 50 years in the future, which is not fair to Searle, but this article and this idea comes out in the 1980s and it makes a big splash. Well, we hadn't hit the sort of um, the artificial neural network revolution then. That comes in in the late 90s and then the 2000s, as you know, you know, the, the, the technology that uh, runs your Google Maps on your phone or that um, is running all these really sophisticated uh, pattern recognition uh, programs on the web. Or, I, you know, I've been using this example from our class. Um, you know, I've used these visualizers here to demonstrate how connectionist networks um, change the game. They, they change the fundamentals about how uh, artificial systems are uh, doing things like visual concept recognition. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present an, yet another position. Call it, for the sake of argument, strong artificial neural network thesis. Um, which is different than the strong AI position that we looked at from the 1970s. Um, so as a first pass, let's say this, an adequately designed artificial neural network with image recognition, natural language processing, theory of mind, and self-representation that passes the Turing test is a mind that understands stories, has other cognitive states, and explains the human ability to understand stories and answer questions about them. Okay, so not what Shank had presented and not what Searle had originally argued against. And I also want you to now fold in all that you've learned about connectionist networks and about artificial neural networks and how they do their work. Because I think your intuition is going to be different now. Um, and I don't think that Searle's argument works against this kind of uh, position. Okay, so I'll ask these in forms of questions. Does the Chinese room thought experiment refute strong ANN? Um, I, okay, so we would have to construct some sort of comparable Chinese room thought experiment that mimics or puts Searle into the place of the um, executive unit in a uh, artificial neural network. I'm not sure how that works now because by definition, by its nature, a connectionist network is diffuse, it's parallel, it's distributed, it's probabilistic. It has all these different features that the GoFi system did not have. And I'm not sure how or what sort of role Searle could play that would mimic his role when he's trying to refute the GoFi position. Um, so I, I offer that up as a sort of suggestive question for a place where you could object to Searle on modern grounds. What would Searle in the Chinese room have to be doing in a comparable argument against the strong ANN position? Where would he be? What sort of commands would he be executing? Um, would he be a node? Um, we saw that like one of the connectionist nodes in that network. So in the picture that I've captured here, um, this is a famous um, handwriting uh, image recognition task that AI systems, modern ANN systems, are very good at. So a handwritten nine, once it's filtered through this um, deep learning, um, uh, large data set, um, backpropagation artificial neural network system that's been trained up with millions and millions of um, data points, um, once you do all of the adjusting of all of those nodes, this thing gets very good at identifying nines and eights and sevens and all the different sorts of handwriting cursive. And by extension, we're imagining that a sufficiently sophisticated cluster or, or system that's built up out of these kinds of ANN systems could perform these other functions that humans perform when they're understanding a story. Okay, now where would Searle go into this example to play the kind of role that would generate this, this intuition that it does in the Chinese room original argument? And I don't know where it would go. I don't understand how it could be. We've gotten rid of this homunculus inside the system. 
um, Searle has been playing the homunculus, and now that I think about it, that's sort of how this argument works, is it predicates on this assumption about the, uh, the position of a little person inside the head that's doing all this work. Well, that was the mistake that, that Leibniz had made, and Dennett complains about this. There is no homunculus. At some level, we have to push down to processing. That's not done by another little dude inside the head, because that presents us with the same problem. If there's a little guy inside the head, well, how do they do what they do? Um, does that guy have a mind? And if he has a mind, then who's doing his mind work for him? Is that another little homunculus inside his head? And Daniel Dennett's famous for having generated this infinite homuncular regress problem uh, for people who formulate the argument the way Searle and the way Descartes had done in these kinds of contexts. Um, could Searle even do what an artificial neural net network does? And I'm not sure that he could. Um, are our intuitions the same here? And if I've done my job right, I think they sh the answer should be no. I don't think we have the same intuitions here. And I don't think a Chinese room uh, thought experiment works in this kind of case. So it may be that Searle's argument gives us a strong intuition, but it's only because it's based on a bunch of false assumptions and based on things that we didn't know about how um, artificial neural networks could mimic the activity and the work of biological neural networks. Um, okay. So let's wrap this up. Searle claims behavior, behaviorism and functionalism are utterly refuted by this experiment, leaving dualistic and identity theoretic hypotheses in control of the field. He's referring to sort of all pre-1980s positions. Searle's own hypothesis of biological naturalism may be characterized sympathetically as an attempt to wed or unsympathetically as an attempt to waffle between the remaining dualistic and identity theoretic alternatives. Okay, that's all framed without any of the 50 years of subsequent development in artificial intelligence research. Uh, furthermore, Searle says the formal, see, he thinks he's shown that the formal symbol manipulations by themselves don't have any intentionality. They're quite meaningless, and they aren't even symbol manipulations since the symbols don't symbolize anything. In linguistic jargon, they have only syntax but no semantics. And that is very much framed in the way that Chomsky and Fodor and the language of thought people were doing this in the 80s when they were thinking about artificial intelligence. Um, the systems reply, the robot reply, and I've suggested the strong ANN reply have potential to refute the Chinese room argument. And there's a whole vast literature here on this, and I've kind of supervised, kind of um, uh, gone over some of those. And your readings with Dennett and Anderson will go into those in more detail. Um, and furthermore, oh, that's it. Uh, that's our conclusion. So you've got the full range of positions here from the original strong uh, AI position. Searle's original objection to it, systems and robot reply objections to Searle, um, Searle's counter rebuttals to the systems and robot replies, and then some of their answers back. Um, I give you Dennett's answer in defense of the systems reply, and then I've also suggested the artificial neural network um, reply as a kind of way to undercut um, Searle's position from the outset.